Dear friends, thank you for being with us uh, in uh, New York for this important session, the last session. The last is always the best. I'm delighted oh. to be in conversation with Shashi Tharoor, my dear friend of many years, the best-selling, award-winning author of 17 books of fiction and non-fiction. Uh, as you know, he's a second-term member of parliament representing Tiruvanthapuram and uh, served as Minister of State for Human Resource Development and also for External Affairs. And he has a phenomenal fan following, which is matched in equal measure by the anger and despair of those who troll him. <laughs> <laughs> who seem to constitute a mini industry by themselves. This is true. So, um, I am not Tunku Vardarajan, just in case you were confused. <laughs> He had to step out of New York, and I've taken over. I have been in conversation with Shashi recently on uh, slightly different subjects. Today, I'm trying to cover the range of questions that Tunku wanted to ask you, sort of, in the uh -huh. queues. Um, where do we begin? We want to cover ground with addressing the writer, the politician, and the diplomat, and the undiplomat. Are that true? But Tinku would probably have asked me about cricket as well. Surely. Of course, I'm going to ask you about cricket. Oh, you are? Though oh, I know right. nothing about cricket, but moderators can ask you. I'll Anything, learn. Absolutely. So, uh, Sh Shashi, your two recent books, which is Inglorious Empire and Why I Am a Hindu, um, they've been bestsellers. They've had a huge impact. Uh, do they overlap somewhere? Perhaps we begin with the colonization of India and the aftermath and the aftertaste of the colonial project in India and around the world. Well, no, they don't... They, I mean, I suppose there are some sort of common concerns emerging from the sensibility of the author, but the, the, the focus of the books are quite different. Inglorious Empire is a book about what the British did to India. It was partly um, the result of a, a, a feisty debate at the Oxford Union where I sort of laid out a case in 10 or 12 minutes uh, against the empire, and it kind of went viral on YouTube, and lots of people were clamoring for more, and my publishers talked me into then taking all the trouble to research the evidence for all the arguments I'd already made, uh, and, then, and then marshalling uh, a book out of that. And became, which became, I'm told, your best-selling book ever? Yes, it's, it's by far my most successful book in hardback ever, in that it sold 100,000 copies in India in hardback, which is quite unusual. There are books that have sold far more than that, but usually in, in uh, paperback in India. So this is, this is quite something for me. And I'm, I'm very pleased that, um, that it's found such a readership. Even more surprisingly, it actually made it to the bestseller list of the UK for a couple of weeks. And there are Brits now reading it and having their eyes opened, judging by the steady stream of mail I get. From, Saving up uh, money for reparations? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, I, you know, I never was a big fan of reparations in a monetary sense because how do you quantify the value of the damage that was done? How do you quantify the value of the lives lost? The 35 million people who died in totally unnecessary famines because of the way in which the British ran the system. Uh, how would you quantify the... The, the, the value of the generations lost to indentured labor and spread around the world, uh, let alone, of course, the actual loot uh, that was drained out of the Indian economy every year. Meticulously, accounts were kept, so we know that down to pound shillings and how much cash they took. That you can quantify, but the rest of it, I'm sorry to say, uh, is much more difficult. So I, I said, you know, now, you know, history has moved on. Maybe all we really need is a symbolic one pound a year for 200 years so they can keep reminding themselves every year of the awful things they did. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, that's my argument. No one else, I think, people who feel as strongly as I do about British colonialism do feel reparations are due in a financial sense. Um, but people on the other side are equally clear it's not going to happen. Also, you know, when you start playing the game of quantifying reparations, it gets to something that would be far too astronomical. If, I mean, Minas Merchant, the Indian journalist, actually did a calculation and published it. And he came up conservatively with three trillion pounds, which is larger than the entire British GDP. So no one's going to be paying that. My, my suggestion is move away from reparations. Let there be moral atonement. Let the English actually teach 
um, colonial, unvarnished colonial history in their schools. Let it not be a country where you can get A levels in history uh, without learning a line of colonial history. Let it be a country in which, um, in which uh, all these wonderful museums in their imperial capital. I mean, every museum in London is a chore bazaar. You know, it's a, it's a, a collection of. Um, collection of looted artifacts from the colonies. But there isn't a single museum to colonialism itself, to the wrongs done uh, and the, the greater glories uh, as they would see it thereof. There's an imperial war museum, but there's no imperialism museum. And I think it's a shame that the, the British are growing up with this very convenient historical amnesia, uh, occasionally leavened by um, rose-tinted you know, soap opera shows on television. Indian Summer and The Jewel and the Crown or The Far Pavilions. Uh, the Jewel and the Crown was a very fine book, but the TV series took away all the, <laughs> all the fine stuff and kept in only the imperial nostalgia. And the problem is that as a result, people really don't have much of a sense of the damage they did. There was a poll um, by YouGov, which I think polls disproportionately young people. And some 59% said they thought the British Empire was a great thing and they would love to have it back. <laughs> Well, you're not getting it, if any Brits in this audience, but, uh, uh, but the fact is that um, it clearly shows the gap in the education about it. So that's that one. And the, on, on why I'm a Hindu, it's very different. It's responding to the current climate in India. Yes. As uh, privileged a much more distorted idea of what Hinduism so is all about than what I grew up with. So on that, I was wondering... Would you say that the aggressive and resurgent avatar of Hinduism which we are witnessing might be a reaction to the thousand or so years of invasions and the rule of a non-Hindu minority? Did it lead to a wounding of the Hindu psyche perhaps, a collective loss of self-esteem? Or did it conversely testify to the strength of Hindu thought that carried on um, undeflected in a way? No, I think there is a, a strong kernel of truth in, in your question that particularly for some in northern India, uh, this uh, 1947 seemed to represent an opportunity to, as they saw it, right certain wrongs of the preceding 1,200 years. I come from the south where our historical experience is very different, and, and we don't see Islam or Christianity or any other faith that way. They all came in peace. Uh, and they came with trade. And they came with trade, with travelers, missionaries, teachers, preachers. Uh, we went out and embraced it. We actually had a Kerala king who went off to the uh, Saudi Peninsula to meet this prophet he'd heard so much about. And he actually met the prophet, but didn't make it back uh, to India, died in the Saudi Peninsula. But the legacy of his, um, of his visit to the prophet Muhammad uh, was, uh, is still to be seen today if you fly into Muscat in Oman. Uh, there are on the fringes of the peninsula Kerala coconut trees growing, which are not native to the Saudi Peninsula. They were taken from Kerala by this Kerala king. So we have a very different experience. But the problem for me, you speak of an assertive um, Hindu nationalism, but it's actually based on a rather dismaying inferiority complex. These are people whose Hinduism has been conquered, subjugated, humili they feel a humiliation, an ancestral humiliation they want to overcome. And their um, assertion or aggressiveness today is uh, to, to the, the unsuccessful removal uh, of a chip from their shoulder. Whereas uh, the Hinduism that I have seen, read, grown up, practiced, uh, and been taught is, is a much more self-confident Hinduism. So that you're has, talking about a north-south divide? Partly. Partly, but I grew up mainly in the north, so it's uh, even if my, my, my roots and the roots of my faith are therefore from the south, I grew up in Bombay, went to high school in Calcutta, went to college in Delhi. And I studied Indian history in all of these places, so I know um, the history of the north. I know far more about the Delhi Sultanate and the Mughals than I do about the Vijayanagar Empire, which wasn't taught in Bombay, Calcutta or Delhi when I was growing up. But another the form of uh, colonialism? Another form of, I think, just... Bad syllabus writing, but that's another issue. Uh, uh, what I will say, however, is that, is, that, um, is that Hinduism survived all of these various assaults upon it. And if you want, you can go back to about 500 BC, because Buddhism was a reform movement against Hinduism. Uh, the Hindus um, uh, sort of reeled back under the impact of Buddhism and Jainism, and then they regrouped and came over, absorbed uh, Buddhism in, in, into, into, into Hinduism for all practical purposes in India. Uh, when Islam came, Hinduism again found new 
um, resurgent uh, responses to it, including the creation of a different faith in Sikhism, but Sikhism too emerging from the same bhakti movement that found new forms of worship and of responding to the, to the ideas of the divine under the impact of Islamic colonization. So I don't see it, I don't see this narrative that the Hindutvavadis, the Sangh Parivar, sees of, uh, of sort of unbridled Muslim oppression of beleaguered and conquered Hindus. I see a much more uh, interesting, stimulating exchange that resulted in a lot of syncretism. The Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb you keep hearing about uh, in the north. Um, and, and if you like, one area of overlap is the way in which the Brits came in and ossified a lot of this. Because the sense of separate identities really didn't exist until the Brits have created. It's quite striking, for example, if you look at Lucknow, where um, the Lucknow of Wajid Ali Shah, um, they used to commemorate Muharram every year, jointly, the Sunnis, the Shias, and the Hindus yes. together. The Brits came, and they said, no, 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 our books tell us that Muharram is a Shia thing. Out with the Sunnis, out with the Hindus, only the Shias will get to run the show. And soon enough, the sniping started from the Sunnis, and the first incidents of Sunni Shia violence happened under British rule and not under Nawabi rule. Now, this kind of um, a tendency to want to control, to categorize, to classify, is common to all colonists. Uh, it's sort of, you know, the map and the museum are very much instruments of colonialism, and so is the census. So you use the census to ask people to identify themselves along the lines of categories you as the colonizer can understand, can classify and can control. And that's where these monolithic Hindu-Muslim uh, identities began to emerge and became internalized in the consciousness of Indians. It didn't help that after the revolt of 1857, the mutiny as the British called it, we had also a very conscious effort to divide and rule. The famous memo from Elphinstone who said that uh, Divide et impera was the ancient Roman maxim, and it shall be ours. And with that, you had this increasing consciousness that ultimately culminated uh, after you know, many stages I've described in the book uh, in partition. Now, whether we should today still be prisoners of all of these things, I, I, I strongly contest. A lot of good work being done by modern historians has established that the actual reality was very different. And there is so much evidence, not just anecdotal, but historically grounded evidence of um, the community's interpenetration, cooperation, not just coexistence, but going well beyond that, so that you have story after story of, let's say, Hindu uh, temples being destroyed in natural calamities and Muslims coming to help rebuild it. You have Hindus thronging to Muslim shrines. You have the Dagar brothers singing Hindu devotionals. Uh, you know, you, you have all of these uh, elements of cultural exchange and, 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 and mutuality, which are sought to be denied by this Hindu-Muslim binary narrative that I reject. But uh, to move to the next question, which I ask you in every time we are in these subjects, you've said Hinduism offers the world a perfect religion for the 21st century. But would you say it is beleaguered within? How, in the face of so much regression, superstition, caste, and gender oppression being published, uh, being practiced, and what my um, friend um, um, Kanchai Laya's book says, why I'm not a Hindu, uh, the, the paradox of a religion that uh, puts its own flock outside the purview of its blessings. So uh, what do you have to say about that? Well, I mean, about on that point, I would say it's not the religion, it's, it's social practice, and social practice is always up for contestation, rejection, and social reformers. The laws of Manu? Throughout. But the laws of Manu, there's very, very little evidence as to, as to whether they were really observed as written. There are many things that exist. I'm not sure that every Hindu uh, practiced every, Point every bit of advice in the Kama Sutra either. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, the fact is that the, the, these books were, 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 were propounded, but for every blood curdlingly misogynistic or casteist pronouncement of the Manu Smriti, I can give you others in other equally sanctified ancient texts that preach against caste discrimination and that celebrate uh, the authority, autonomy, and, 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 and role of women. So, you know, to, for us to just take, a, you know, cherry-pick texts that, that, that demonstrate one thing, 
I mean, I can't do it. I, I can't cherry pick a text and just say, look, Hinduism is a wonderfully uh, broad-minded and inclusive religion when you can point to the others. All I'm saying is the religion, because it's not a religion of one holy book, but of multiple sacred texts, offers you an awful lot to pick from. What you pick is up to you. If you choose to pick the misogynist or casteist or, uh, 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 or offensive bits of the faith and say my religion allows me to discriminate against people or to oppress people, that's your fault, not the religions. It's, it's, it's a religion that's been existing for three and a half thousand years is bound to have had a lot of accretions, a lot of uh, ideas which were constantly meant to be reevaluated uh, with the test of time. But let me go back to the beginning of your question. You said, you know, my arguing that Hinduism is a, is, is a, is a great religion century. for the 21st. And there are many arguments I make in the book, but I'll mention only two in our conversation. The first is, of course, the wonderful fact that in an era of, of uncertainty, of incertitudes, you have uniquely a religion that privileges incertitude and doubt. Hinduism rests on the idea that there's a heck of a lot we don't know and won't know. So, for example... The Rig Veda's creation hymn, which is a few pages into the, into the Rig Veda, uh, actually says, you know, where does this whole universe come from? Who made all of this uh, heaven and earth? You know, maybe he in the heaven knows, or maybe even he does not know. Uh, a religion that is prepared to question the omniscience of the creator uh, is, is, to my mind, uh, a wonderful faith for a modern or a postmodern sensibility. On top of that, You've got this um, extraordinary um, eclecticism, not just the multiple holy books, the multiple ways of, of seeing truth. Even when Hinduism moved from the shapeless, formless idea of God, the Nirgura Brahman, to the idea, which is very much an Islamic idea today too, that you don't give God a shape, a form, a gender. God is unknowable. That was the original Hindu idea for many centuries. The God without attributes. The God without attributes and without qualities. And then they uh, realized that the people needed something more because the Vedic Hindus were busy worshipping rivers and mountains and trees instead because they wanted to see and visualize something. So then emerged the concept of the Saguna Brahman and Ishwar, Bhagwan, words that are the equivalent today, I suppose, of God, um, came into being and people were allowed to imagine God. But even there, the Hindus stuck to an incertitude. This instance, no one knows what God looks like. You're free to imagine God as you wish because your personalizing of God in your mind is merely a crutch for the limitations of your imagination to imagine the unimaginable. No one has seen God, therefore you can, if you want to imagine God as a, a, a pot-bellied guy with an elephant head, that's fine, Ganesh. You want to imagine God as an eight-armed woman riding a tiger, Durga, that's fine too. And by the same logic, if you want to imagine God as a bleeding man on the cross, that would be acceptable to Hindu thought as well. Because these are all ways of imagining something which you have to... And, and Hinduism says, always, always of reaching, of reaching out to the divine are equally valid. Vekanand used to quote the Shiva Mahimna Strotram, which said that as many rivers flow in their different ways and directions, some crooked, some straight, to the same sea, so also all ways of reaching out to the divine reach the same Brahman, reach the same place, and therefore it doesn't really matter. That Hindu idea is the first thing that I, I value greatly, but flowing from it is something Swami Vivekananda said. And Swami Vivekananda, uh, everyone knows, he's, he, uh, he came to America in 1893, was given five minutes to address the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago, and spoke so brilliantly that he kept being asked to continue and come back, and he ended up making five or six speeches instead of just one uh, at this conference. Uh, but in that, um, in that series of, of addresses in Chicago, he laid out, I think, the basis for Hinduism that a modern uh, Indian uh, Hindu can appreciate and, and live up to. And one of the things he said that I read as a teenager and stayed with me throughout was this wonderful statement of his that I'm proud to speak to you in the name of a religion that has taught the world not just tolerance, but acceptance. You see, I grew up and went to school and learned that tolerance is a virtue. Uh, your textbooks tell you a tolerant king is a good king because he tolerates all the other opinions of his subjects and so on. But when you really think about it, as Vivekananda clearly had, tolerance is a dreadfully patronizing idea. Because what does tolerance say? Tolerance says, I have the truth, you are in error, but I will magnanimously indulge you in your right to be wrong. <laughs> but 
acceptance, which is what Vivekananda says Hinduism is all about, goes well beyond that. It says, I believe I have the truth. You believe you have the truth. I will respect your truth. Please respect my truth. And to my mind, this is a very, very wonderful basis in a multi-religious um, society like ours for Hinduism as a religion of 80% of the people to be able to coexist uh, with, with other faiths that are different. That's what makes it such a good So on, on that point, I want to, this was going to be my last question, but I'm going back to it. I, I, I have two more questions to ask, which are very important. But in your book, Why I Am a Hindu, you mentioned how Mahatma Gandhi was a great exemplar of this sort of uh, accepting mm-hmm. Hinduism. That, and in response to being classified a Hindu, he said, I am a Hindu, a Muslim, a Christian, a Parsi, a Jew. It is equally valid to recall Muhammad Ali Jinnah's response. He said, only a Hindu could say that. <laughs> so is your, your book is indeed a testimony to the pluralism of the faith. Do you believe this abiding pluralism will tide over? I believe so because I, I am profoundly convinced that it, it really is bred into the bone, as it were, of the Indian people and that the kind of bigotry that we have seen whipped up in recent years is, a, is essentially a political exercise and not, uh, to my mind, in any way reflective of the actual spirit of most of the Indian people. I think that, you know, you, you, can, you can get people worked up uh, and you can get people to be hostile to their fellow human beings, in this case their fellow citizens, um, on, on superficial external grounds of caste or religion or, or, or creed. But you can't really change their fundamental nature. And I believe that Indians essentially have lived together for far too long to allow periodic spasms of bigotry or unpleasantness to derail them from the path. After all, we went through a similar spasm at the time of partition. A million people lost their lives in savage sectarian butchery. And yet we knew that in India for decades afterwards, we lived oblivious to religious differences amongst us. So I would like to think what we're going through now is just an awful temporary phase which will pass. So on on the same note, Section 377, which uh, criminalized homosexuality, has been amended. And you have done a lot of work on this and passed a private member's bill in Parliament uh, for the dignity uh, and right to privacy and... uh, of um, the homosexual community. Uh, do you want to talk? Because this is, in a way, a victory for uh, many things. Uh, yeah, this. well, it didn't pass Parliament. In fact, I tried to introduce it yes, twice, and it Supreme got shouted Court down did, yes. by Tell the bigots. So, in fact, what was interesting was that, um, was that the courts were ahead of the elected representatives of the people on this, and that's sometimes the function of a court. It's true in America as well. The Supreme Court has often been ahead of... Uh, of, of the prejudices of elected legislators. And I think we've seen the same in India. Section 377 was a colonial legacy. It, uh, it, it, it really uh, meant that a section of our citizens were being deprived of the rights that the rest of us could take for granted. And it seemed to me morally wrong that should happen. Why should some Indian citizens, merely for who they were, because God made them that way or nature made them that way or whatever, be punished by the state and be criminalized for being who they were. And that's what I thought was unacceptable. So I tried the parliamentary route, not once, but twice. It failed both times because there was too much entrenched hostility. And I myself declared at that time, and I'm not going to try a third time, because Einstein's famous definition of insanity has doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I said, now the only different result can come from the judicial system. And the Supreme Court of India, which in many ways has been in the vanguard, for example, of interpreting what's already in our constitution in a more expansive way, expanding women's rights, for example, has by extending the equality clause, the dignity clause, the privacy, the right to privacy, which it itself had read into the constitution only last year, all of these have, I think, finally brought dignity to... So would you say that that was also in some sense a colonial legacy, the laws of homosexuality? Uh, uh, most definitely it was, because before the colonial era, you know, homosexuality has been something that has been accepted in the same theory of acceptance I've been talking about as a reality of society. It was not necessarily approved of or celebrated, 
But it was accepted. Go and look at the temple walls of Khajuraho and you'll see what I mean. Uh, go, and, go and read. Even the Kama Sutra does talk about the fact that these... I mean, it doesn't encourage the practice. It doesn't, uh, doesn't applaud it. But it acknowledges and recognizes that these things exist. The fact is, Indian society had long made its peace. Look at the whole role in our society of hijras, for example who are, who are uh, transgender. And, and, and who had uh, social justice and uh, legal justice before the homosexual? They did, but the, uh, the more important point is our society has lived with difference indeed. for a very long time, and yet uh, our laws were changed by the Brits to criminalize something which uh, was probably marginalized before but never made criminal. And, uh, and the result um, uh, was that we, we internalized the British era prejudices. To my mind, the government has no place in the bedroom. And we had to wait till 2018 for the government to announce that. So to return to my Tunku Varadarajan moment, oh. and to, uh, to again what is really a question about colonialism, and one of the great gifts of colonialism is cricket, and indeed cricket and nationalism. And I'll have to read out this question because I really don't know much about cricket, but okay. I'll learn. Your 2009 book, Shadows Across the Playing Field, which in fact you brought to the Jaipur Literature Festival, and I remember, discussed 60 years of the turbulent trajectory of India-Pakistan cricket relations with Shehriyar Khan, who was the former Foreign Secretary of Pakistan. And head of their cricket board. And head of their cricket board. Now we have the former cricket icon, Imran Khan is the Prime Minister of Pakistan. He's invited Indian cricketers to its to his swearing in, has generated its own share of controversy. Would you say the sporting spirit will come into play between the two countries and will it all be cricket again? <laughs> <laughs> well, on the literal answer, I certainly hope so. I would love to see more cricket being played between the two countries. We just beat them yesterday, so one feels all the more happy to say this. Uh, <laughs> uh, that sounds nationalistic. We want to... <laughs> totally nationalistic. But... Uh, why should I concede nationalism to the other party? I'm equally <laughs> chauvinist when I need to be. No, but coming back to uh, the larger purport of your question, Otunku's, uh, it seems to me that though Imran, whom, by the way, I first met in New York, his sister was a colleague of mine in the UN, and I met him at her home uh, almost 30 years ago. So I've known him for a long time. He's a fine human being, great company. What you have to understand, however, is that he is now a prime minister with a fairly clear level of military backing. And the experience we have had with Pakistan for the last 70 years shows us that it's what the Pakistani military decides that will determine the prospects for any genuine or lasting peace between our countries. Um, I, I've often remarked that in India, the state has an army, and in Pakistan, the army has a state. Um, they have ruled it directly for 32 years, four military coups, and they've ruled it indirectly the other 38 years by essentially controlling how much the government could do or not do. And every time a civilian government in Pakistan has attempted to make some progress in responding to Indian peace overtures, every single time it's been interrupted by either military action directly undertaken by the Pakistan army, as in Kargil in 99, or uh, militants unleashed by the Pakistani army's notorious ISI, as we saw with 2611. But, so the question that comes up to any Indian government is, is it worth talking to a civilian government in Pakistan, or are they all either unable or unwilling to fulfill their professions of peace? That worry will remain whoever is prime minister. But, Imran is a good guy, and if the military decide they want peace, he'll be a wonderful face for that peace. But if the military decide they want hostility, I'm sure he's equally capable of being an effective voice for hostility. So That's what I also what have to do to wanted survive. to know here was that does cricket act like a vent or a surrogate war or, or just does it like a pressure cooker for uh, emotions between the two countries? Now that I disagree with. I, you know, first of all, the, the paradox of India-Pakistan relations is there's really very little problem between Indians and Pakistanis as people. New York has evidence for this. Yeah. I mean, uh, there are very, very, very many good friendships between Indians and Pakistanis many in, in the this audience city. From I'm Pakistan sure there are many in this audience. I knew of marriages across the nationalities. Uh, uh, many a Pakistani taxi driver used to try and refuse to, to take my money on the grounds that I was a brother, which, of course, always won him a bigger tip. But still, <laughs> the fact is that this, this, 
this kind of stuff uh, is very common here. And therefore, when it comes to cricket, it, it genuinely is much more a sporting encounter. For those who would try and make it, as, 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 as an American writer said, war minus the shooting, I think it's not that. Because I think it's unfair to expect cricket or any other sport to bear the burden of a political relationship or a military uh, uh, tension between two countries. A sport is a sport. It should be seen as such. Uh, whether we win or lose will have no bearing on whether we're going to be able to make peace with the Pakistani authorities. And I honestly think we should separate the two, which is one of the reasons I've been a consistent advocate of more cricket between the two countries, even when our political relationship was estranged, because I genuinely believe we have to separate the two. So on that note, because I know so many people are eager to ask questions, should we move to the audience? True. Yeah? Do we, uh, who, who's doing the mics? Yeah, but if I can see, because I can't see... Yeah, we have there. these lights shining in our eyes, so we can't see any we hands. We begin going. here, and if we can just get the... So if we can't see, will you sort of... Yeah, many questions. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tarul. Can you yeah. hear me, sir? Sure, we Karam. understand. Oh, wait, okay, great. Uh, my name is Karam Dahia, and I have this question for you. Um, partition, was that, uh, was that necessary? Was that a good idea? And think about yourself. Let's say you were either Mr. Jinnah or you were Nehru. What do you think you would have done? Which, which are you just now? I mean, well, and my sympathies are with Nehru, I have to admit. Uh, look, I, I personally don't think that partition uh, was either necessary or unavoidable till a, a very, very um, last sort of period. I mean, I, I would say it only really was dreamt up in 1940 with the Muslim League's resolution. And even then, no one took the idea particularly seriously. They saw it as a bargaining chip. But I think it accelerated between 40 and 46 to a point where it became inevitable then. Um, and there were a number of reasons. I mean, the divide and rule policy had not fully worked because a large number of Indian Muslims did not support the Muslim League. In fact, there were significant support not only for the Congress Party from Indian Muslims, but also for two non-sectarian parties, the Unionist Party in Punjab, which was both Hindu and Muslims, big peasants, landlords, and so on, and then the Krishuk Praja Party in Bengal, which was, again, uh, farmers, peasants, and so on. And Muslim votes were therefore divided four ways across, across most of India. And it was by no means clear that the Muslim League was ever going to have a majority amongst Indian Muslims for a demand for a separate state. And most Indian Muslims um, had lived together with Indian Hindus, uh, you know, participated in each other's joys and sorrows, festivals, uh, uh, professional relationships, and no one would have thought that they could be separated. I think what went wrong was, um, in, in, this is my personal view, was when the Congress uh, decided in protest against the British declaring war uh, without consulting the elected uh, provincial governments, the Congress decided to resign all their offices. And the British promptly leapt at this opportunity to appoint unelected Muslim leaguers to offices they hadn't won, which enabled the Muslim League to then organize itself using the power and patronage available from British patronage and, and tax money in order to build up their support. They went from something like uh, 2 lakh members in 1939 to 20 million or 2 crore by 1945 just on the basis of the opportunities they had to exercise power and influence during the war years. And during that time, the Congress leadership declared the Quit India Movement, got arrested and all went to jail, leadership, workers, everybody. So they were completely out of the fray for five years while the Muslim League was able to organize, amass its resources and preach its message. So a party which had failed to win even a simple majority of Muslim seats in the 1937 elections swept the 1946 elections. Then that became, their plank was Pakistan. They had won all the seats. They became intractable. The government, uh, the British tried to create an interim government of both the League and the Congress. The League joined it only to wreck it from within, refused to participate in any decisions. The finance minister was a Muslim leaguer. He wouldn't submit a budget. It became unworkable. And, and the Congress leadership at that point said, it's very clear that the only way we can actually run this country is 
by getting rid of these people and, and, and therefore agreeing to what they want, which happened to be partition. I, I have to say that um, those peculiar sets of circumstances can really all be attributed to a six, seven year period. I do not believe that until then partition was at all unavoidable. But when it came to 46, 47, I think by then um, you can't blame uh, Nehru and the Congress party for conceding uh, to Jinnah's demand at that point. I know there are many today in India who uh, enjoy blaming Nehru for everything, including partition, but the truth is, at that point, there was no reasonable other alternative. And the, the formula of the Crips mission, which Jinnah almost, almost definitely insincerely said he would accept, was a formula that would have created a very weak India with three groups of provinces that could have had the right to secede anyway. And I think it would have been a recipe for uh, an ungovernable country. I think what we've got in the end, uh, despite the tragedy and the, the horrors that visited partition, is something that we really now have to make a success of, and we can with the, the new realities post-47. Next question. Hi, I'm uh, Priya. Um, Malhotra, and uh, good evening. I'm, I very much admire short, your short eloquence. Short questions, because there are but, other people. Uh, and, and now let me get to the point. The que- what you was, what you, you, when you say you're a Hindu, and uh, and uh, it seemed to me the question that I, I have is that. If one takes any religion and extracts the best, and I think you also went to missionary schools, and, and I did too, I can take the best of Christianity and, and, or, or of anything but else. But, bo- but, both, but both, but what exactly is a religion? Is a religion just the text, or is a religion practice? I guess that is, that is, that is the essence of the question. Thank you. Well, I've, I've gone into this in the book, and I really hope you'll read it. I think there are copies available today, are there not? Are there copies available? Good. Uh, the, fact is that, um, the fact is that, to my mind, a religion involves both theory and practice. And the Hindu religion in particular anatomizes this very clearly by talking about the, the four yogas that Hindus can practice as part of their pursuit of the divine. There is jnana yoga, which is knowledge, theory, the text. There is bhakti yoga, which is worship and devotion, going to temples, all of that. There is karma yoga, which is action, service, including service to the poor, the unfortunate. All this is a form of worship as well. And then there is raja yoga, uh, interiority, meditation, seeking. You know, I often joke that others look to God in the heavens. The Hindu looks for God within himself. So that interiority of, of, of reflection that also uh, is part of uh, religious practice. All of this, therefore, is religion, and all of this involves both practice and theory. But I draw a distinction between religion, which is always concerned with the spiritual, and social practice, which, to my mind, is different. Now, there is, to my mind, there is a distinction between Hindus as a practitioners of a faith and a certain spiritual yearning, and Hindus as a social community, which include, for example, those who choose to practice caste and who claim sanction for their, for their bigotry in their religion, which people like Vivekananda rejected utterly. Uh, I mean, Vivekananda was outraged, for example, by the prevalence of child marriage, in which child marriage was sought to be defended in the name of religion. That when the British, for example, tried to change the permissible law of marriage for a young girl, there were people claiming you are actually uh, offending the Hindu faith. And Swami Vivekananda railed against that and attacked them for using religion uh, uh, to to perpetuate a social injustice. So I draw that distinction clearly. I recognize that many others may not do so, but that that would be the difference that I would draw. Thank you very much. Next question. Yeah. Uh, My name is Prabhagaran. Um, I'm in semi-retirement from journalism. I spend my time writing books that nobody reads. <laughs> uh, the question, Welcome to the club. It's thank a familiar you. <laughs> um, a question, two questions I have. First question on the first subject uh, that you tackled. The second question on the second subject. The first question about colonialism. Yes, many, many, many bad things they did completely 
uh, exploited India. But a few good things also they did. One thing I can think of, the greatest unifying force in India is the English language. You are able to address this international audience because of that language, because of colonialism. Couple of good things, okay? So of course, they originally introduced the language for some other reason. Me, no. we had a second short part, second part, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I'll be brief. Um, go on, lost, go on. I lost my train of thought. Anyway, <laughs> the second part is about the truth that Vivekananda said. What Vivekananda said was a variation of what he said in the Bhagavad Gita. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is said there are two ways to him. If you are a for the, for the active, it is the path of hard work. For the contemplative, it is the path of knowledge. That is the truth, the H, capital H. That him is the truth. Truth has only one meaning. Uh, what Vivekananda meant was that, your way to truth, I will accept, and you please accept my way to truth, okay? Thank you. Thank exactly. you very much. For On the second one, I agree completely. On the first one, I disagree completely, uh, because, um, the British had absolutely no intention of doing anything to benefit anybody in India but themselves. Uh, they came to do well and pretended to do good later. But the fact is that, uh, the, fact is that the, the, the entire colonial enterprise was motivated by nothing more than material greed for the wealth and resources of India and the profits of the East India Company. Now, having said that, you're right that a number of things have been left behind which we continue to use and benefit from, or in the case of Section 377, suffered from. But those things that were left behind were all brought into India solely for the benefit of the imperial enterprise to expand British control, to enhance British profits, and to further and prolong British rule. They were not meant to aid Indians. If in the process, Indians were able to acquire or even snatch certain benefits, that's to the credit of Indians and not to the colonialists. If you take the English language, since you mentioned that as an example, the British had no desire to educate the vast majority of Indians. They wanted to educate, in Macaulay's famous words, a very small sliver, a small class of Indians, as he put it, uh, uh, Indians in blood and color, but English in taste and opinions and morals and in intellect. And the purpose of this very small class was to assist them as a kind of, to govern India and to serve as a buffer between the British elite and the millions whom they governed. He made it very clear that they were not prepared to spend the money it would take to impart English education to all of Indians. Uh, and indeed, the British were so niggardly in their expenditure, and I use that in the old fashioned sense of the word, uh, they were so miserly in their expenditure on education that as late as 1930, the American historian Will Durant came to India and wrote with horror that the entire sum total of expenditure in India and everything, all levels of education from the lowest primary school to the highest university was less than one half the high school budget of the state of New York. That was the British Empire for you. So I do not give the British any credit for having taught us English. They taught a minimal amount of English to a minimal amount of people to further their own interests. Indians then said this is useful for us and we will therefore teach it. So the vast majority of schools and colleges and universities where Indians learned English were established by Indians, not by the English. So when Raja Ram Mohan Roy sets up seven colleges in Calcutta and the British had set up precisely one, you can see the difference. You are looking at Indians trying to take this upon themselves and then indeed benefits happen. So when Jawaharlal Nehru used English as a language of Indian nationalism, he was doing something that the British had never intended him to be able to do with that English language. But I give the British no credit for it, sir. Uh, do we have one last question? I think that side, nobody has had a question. We have to eat, huh? We have to eat. Ten minutes more. Hello, sir. My name is Anirudh, uh, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of your books and actually a bigger fan of the vocabulary you use. Um, I'm also, also very happy about the fact that we have politicians like you who are so global and absolutely intellectual. Thank My you. question is this, that in your book you have mentioned that uh, 
like Britain needs to be uh, properly educated about the imperialism and the colonialism. <clears throat> but uh, from your book, what I've read, and also uh, the recent book that I'm reading, which is like Indian Summer by Alex Von, Alex Von Tunzelman, uh, what they have done is absolutely horrific. And when I was growing up in India, around basically 96, 97, when I finished school there, <clears throat> nothing like that was taught to me. And I'm actually aghast and disgusted about the things that happened around partition, what uh, Mountbatten and his team did, and all those things. So what do you think needs to happen with our education system back in India? So, our education in India? Yeah. Just the answer. Let's just take one Hello. So this is in the same vein. Um, you mentioned the, that the realities of colonialism must be taught. And I'm a student and I'm trying to learn that. But how do we even begin to deconstruct the ways in which the colonial production of knowledge still pervades our understanding and our knowledge systems? How do we separate the two? It's, it's impossible. In fact, both of you really are coming down to the exact same proposition that haven't our minds also been colonized? Because that was very much an objective of colonialism was the colonization of the minds of the subject peoples. And, uh, and certainly, uh, it's very difficult to move away from uh, the ways in which we have been socialized. Our, our syllabuses in India, in independent India, in many ways continued from the days of the Brits. Um, we study Shakespeare. We don't study Kalidasa. We read the Bible and the ancient European classics, but we don't read the Mahabharata and the Ramayana in schools. Uh, th there, are, there are enormous, enormous... Uh, 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 legacies still lingering um, as an intellectual consequence of 200 years of being colonized. But people are waking up better late than never. And I think we are uh, discovering that there are a number of things we need, to, we need to rethink. Part of my frustration is that the waking up has unfortunately been accompanied by more uh, chauvinist zeal than common sense. So that you're seeing, for example, um, not a sensible rediscovery, for example, of ancient Indian science, which really was remarkably advanced. And there's enough uncontestable evidence that can be brought forward and studied, and our children can learn about these things. Instead, you're hearing absolutely stupid fantasies about the internet having existed in the days of the Mahabharata. And, <laughs> Uh, jet travel having been common in the uh, Vedic Fueled by donkey urine. <laughs> uh, fueled by donkey urine. Well, that's, it would have to theory. be a donkey, obviously, uh, to, pro to produce that. So, um, so the, the challenge now is for the post-colonial society to find its own truth, but to find it uh, in a way that will actually earn it the respect of the world rather than be seen with, with sort of pity and condescension by people who can obviously laugh at some of the more preposterous claims that have been advanced uh, by some of our, our resident chauvinists. Um, but going back to our education system, I think, yes, we do need to, to, to revamp a lot of it. Uh, ours being a federal system, the school syllabuses are established by the state government. So in many ways, that is a bit of a challenge. We do have one central educational board the CBSC and they have um, uh, an attempt, they have attempted successfully to establish some national standards, but by and large the school systems are, are run by states and the higher education university systems are run by the center and we do have some mismatches. But this is an area where again Indians have woken up, there's a genuine concern that we need to do a great deal better than we've done in the last few decades and I believe that the effort that is being made is going to give us quality outcomes. Everything in India takes time, and everything in India that works through the government takes even more time, because the British saddled us with, the, uh, with, their, with their touching belief in bureaucracy. You know, the colonialism rested on the assumption that anything resulting from the filling of forms in quadruplicate couldn't possibly be an injustice. And so process is far more important in our government systems than outcomes. It, everything is about making sure the forms and processes are right. But I think we'll get there and gradually we'll strip away these accretions. You can't do it with a snap of the fingers overnight. And you certainly can't do it 
when you haven't had a revolution, really, you've had a, an evolution. You've taken over the colonial state and have begun very gradually to change it into something uh, different. And that has taken a while. And that while needs to be accelerated, but change is coming. Uh, on that note, thank you, New York. Thank you, Shashi Tharoor.